the weekend of the 24th and 25th of June 1995 will long be remembered for providing the rare chance to compare no less than two famous A4 class locomotives. Plus BR Standard Britannia, all running at maximum permitted speeds on the main line. The weekend's activities were organised by West Anglia Great Northern Railway, Wagon Railway, one of the new train operating companies set up under the British Rail Privatisation Programme. The West Anglia side of its operation covers services from London Liverpool Street to Cambridge, Ely and Kings Lynn, plus the branch to Stansted Airport, opened in 1991. There are also suburban trains to Chingford, Enfield and Hartford East. The Great Northern services include King's Cross to Peterborough and to Cambridge by Royston. Finally, there are suburban services to Welling Garden City and Hartford North. These run from King's Cross and also from Moorgate, using the former underground line that services at Finsbury Park. The whole network covers 258 route miles and 962 passenger trains run on it each weekday. The most historic line on Wagons Map is the one from Liverpool Street to Cambridge and beyond. Opened in 1842 to Bishop Stortford, this line was soon extended north through Cambridge and Ely, and on the 30th of July 1845, it became the first through route to Norwich by linking up at Brandon with the Norwich and Brandon Railway. Despite the later completion of the Colchester route, this was to remain the premier line to Norwich until the turn of the century. Here at Cambridge, Wagon Railway has redecorated the splendid station designed by noted railway architect Francis Thompson. At the platform stands one of the first Class 365 electric units known as Universal Networkers, scheduled to enter public service during 1996. To mark the 150th anniversary of the opening of its main line, Wagon Railway organised an Eastern Counties Steam Weekend on the 24th and 25th of June 1995. This event brought together three of Britain's most notable preserved locomotives. Class A4 Pacifics, numbers 60007, Sir Nigel Gresley, and 60009, Union of South Africa, plus British Railway's Standard Pacific, number 70,000, Britannia. late 1994, Sir Nigel Gresley was repainted at the Great Central Railway into the handsome British Express blue livery used from 1950 to 1952. Britannia, of course, wears the BR green she's carried ever since she rolled out of crew works in January 1951 the first British Railway standard locomotive to be completed. On the afternoon of Friday, the 23rd of June, Volunteers are busy cleaning and servicing the locomotives ready for the following two days. Many volunteers from the A4 Preservation Society and the Britannia Locomotive Society are themselves current BR employees enjoying a trackman's holiday.
Union of South Africa, also West British Railways Brunswick Green. Some may argue about its authenticity, but there's no doubt that this colour gives the A4s a very workmanlike appearance. And in this case, it underlines continuity of service. But number nine was bought direct from BR back in 1966 and hasn't been out of steam for long ever since. Sir Nigel Gresley was also bought direct from BR in 1966, though unlike number nine, she did not have the luxury of a private track to run on during the years of BR steam ban. The 21st A4 built, she was the 100th Gresley Pacific completed by Doncaster Works. She was outshopped in November 1937 named at a ceremony at Marylebone Station on the 26th of that month. Always a particularly strong steamer at free runner, in May 1959 she set a post-war speed record for steam of 112 miles an hour, with the Stevenson Locomotive Society Special descending Stoke Bank, the very same racing ground where sister engine Mallard set her all-time free war record. For most of her time in preservation, Sir Nigel Gresley has worn her original livery of Garter Blue, introduced by the LNER in 1937 for the engines working the Coronation and West Riding Limited Expresses. Soon all the A4s were in Garter Blue, though from the outbreak of war two years later they were repainted black. Garter Blue reappeared once more from 1946 until nationalisation, but like all blue pigments, it tended to weather quickly quite frequent refreshment. Here, this popular loco makes light work of the southbound run over the famous Settle to Carlisle Railway. Union of South Africa has also travelled far and wide since the end of steam. In January 1995, number nine puts up an atmospheric performance as it heads towards Southampton. Railway were the hosts for the loco for several weeks earlier this year when Union of South Africa was used for training mainline footplate crews. It's easy to forget, but it's now so long since everyday working steam finished that the few drivers now left on BR who remember working with mainline steam need regular refresher courses like these. <laughs> Here, in 1995, on Saturday the 24th of June, traditionally Midsummer's Day, Union of South Africa wheels the empty stock for the weekend specials from its stabling point at Cambridge towards Bishop Stormford. It's 7.45am, and running 10 to 1st, the locomotive is subject to a speed restriction of 40 miles an hour. Stood for this duty a driver Archie Plum and fireman Peter Cornwell, accompanied by train crew inspector Richard Wells. All the engine men for the weekend have been on steam refresher courses on the Midhance Railway, while here centre stage on the footplate is John Cameron, number nine's saviour and owner. Only the preserved lines have water tanks these days, and on the mainline runs, watering has to be carefully arranged hydrants are available. The crowds are out at Bishop Stortford and Union and South Africa will have a well-filled train for their first run to Ely. The coaching set of vacuum braked Mark 1 stock is hired from Waterman Rail, the last vehicle being a generator van used to power electric train heating and lighting.
driver Archie Plum of Cambridge Depot worked on the footplate from 1954 to the end of steam. These days he normally drives sprinters on the cross-country run from Birmingham, though he's due to switch to class 317s on Cambridge London services in the near future. class was Gresley's masterpiece. The streamlined shape he used was based on railcar designs by that legend of Italian motor racing, Ettore Bugatti. The rolling stock, too, on the LNER streamliners was designed to minimize wind resistance, and the whole ensemble represented the peak of British railway design and engineering, both in mechanical excellence and as a supreme statement of 1930s elegance. The first four A4s, built in 1935, were designed to haul the LNER Silver Jubilee Express between King's Cross and Newcastle, named in honour of the 25 years of King George V's reign. They were given silver names, and for the first two years of their lives carried a silver livery, as did the complete train. South Africa, completed in 1937, was originally to have been named Osprey, but this was now the year of the coronation of King George VI, and the 584s earmarked for the LNER's fabulous new King's Cross Edinburgh Expresses were given suitably patriotic names in countries of the British Empire. Two new 1937 engines for the West Riding Limited were named Golden Fleece and Golden Shuttle in honour of the Yorkshire woollen industry. In 1945, the latter was renamed Dwight D. Eisenhower after the wartime Supreme Allied Commander. So into Ely, having run for 40 miles from Bishop Stortford in a steady 53 minutes. Despite being midsummer's day, it's cold and grey with a northeast wind across the fence. And it's not only train spotters who need their anoraks on. Driver Plum eases his engine gently to a stand. He'll next set off light engine on the march line then reverse back through E West and E North junctions so as to re-enter the station facing south, ready for the run back to Bishop Stortford. The plaque depicting a spring bog on the left-hand side of the boiler only was presented to the engine by the Bloomfontaine newspaper in 1953. The swan song of the A4s on British Railways came in Scotland on the three-hour expresses between Glasgow and Aberdeen. It was Caledonian all the way, from Glasgow, Buchanan Street, through Cumbernauld, Larbert, Stirling, Perth, and now closed line north via Forfar. By 1965, all the survivors of the class were gathered here, and 6009, actually a Scottish engine all her life, is here passing Larbert on the 9th of August that year. 5.30pm out of Glasgow. 
A short while later, 60026 Miles Beaver runs in with the southbound train. These crack trains generally loaded to just six coaches, including buffet car. Three hours may sound generous for such a load on a 153 mile journey, but on a very switchback road and with three or four intermediate stops, few engines other than the A4s would have been equal to the job. Miles Beaver has a sadly run down appearance in this last year of his life. Six double O two four Kingfisher prepares to leave Aberdeen for the south. This was another of the seven A fours which spent most of their lives in Scotland. By the end of nineteen sixty six, the whole class had been withdrawn, and the Union of South Africa, out of traffic from June that year, was one of the last to go. vans and post office sorting carriages set a far northern scene as 60006 Sir Ralph Wedgwood rolls in. This engine, a recent transfer from England, was built as Gadwall, but took its new name from a sister engine destroyed in an air raid on York in 1942. This is 60015 Quicksilver near Peterborough, one of the original 1935 batch of four engines. Six double O one nine Bittern on a 1966 rail tour. This engine too was sent north to Scotland for its final years and became one of the six preserved members of the class. Though of course both Dwight D. Eisenhower and Dominion of Canada have emigrated to the New World. And the most famous of them all, the holder of the world speed record for steam, Mallard, number six double O double two. In King's Cross. Those scenes of the A4s as workaday machines remind us just how lucky we are to have two of them still active together on this June day 30 years later. Sir Nigel Gresley, incidentally, built November 1937, went north to Scotland in October 1963 and was withdrawn in February 1966. revenue produced over the weekend towards the running costs for each of the locomotives will be most welcome. Keeping mainline engines in tip-top condition is an expensive business. Sir Nigel Presley's last overhaul cost over £130,000. And now it's the turn of number 70,000, Britannia. Seen here near Water Beach, some five miles north of Cambridge. <laughs> Fen flatlands of the Great Eastern Railway Territory, a prime vegetable growing country. And indeed, the Great Eastern was nicknamed the Sweetie among railway men. Gradients, of course, are extremely gentle, and in fact there's nothing steeper than 1 in 107 the whole way between Liverpool Street and Ely, and that for just one mile.
number nine ran an extra trip to Ely on the Saturday, deputising for Britannia, which was dropping excess ash from the pan. Sir Nigel Gresley on the 1716 back from Ely to Bishop's Thorpeford. The last trip of the day would be at 20.52 from Ely. Sir Nigel was active again first thing Sunday morning, with the 8.46 from Bishop Stortford. Here the train is about to cross the Great Ouse near Streatham, four miles south of Ely. Eastern Railway, which first reached Cambridge 150 years ago, was originally planned to be the first railway to York, an honour which of course eventually fell to the Great Northern. It's ironic then that Sir Nigel Bresley's finest products, so closely identified with the Great Northern and York, should now be active on Northern and Eastern metals, which might have been their regular stamping ground if railway history had turned out differently. the 1960s, after a quarter of a century's outstanding performance on the East Coast Main Line, the A4s were displaced by the Deltics. As we've already seen, the surviving engines went north to spend their last years on the Glasgow Aberdeen Line, and 6007, a King's Cross engine all her life, went north to join them in October 1963. Here she departs from Aberdeen in October 1965. And here she leaves Sterling southbound, passing the motive power depot on the right. The date is the 9th of August, 1965. Withdrawal from BR service in February 1966, Sir Nigel Gresley was bought by the A4 Preservation Society, specifically as a mainline runner. She received a major overhaul with crew works and returned to service with her first special in April 1967. Here she passes Berrylands on the London side of Surbiton, with a society special to Southampton and back on the 3rd of June 1967. Possibly the first time an A-form had hauled the handsome post-war bullied rolling stock. Sir Nigel had emerged from crew with Magata Blue that became standard LNER livery for the class. 4498 was her original number. LNER numbering of Dresley Pacifics was both discontinuous and highly confusing. A four name in policy too seemed a touch uncertain for such a prestigious class. Apart from those already mentioned, many of the engines were named after not very well known British birds. Some of the more obscure of these were soon replaced by the names of LNER dignitaries. The company's 1946 renumbering scheme thankfully rationalised this medley into some sort of order, and British Railways of course simply added 60,000 two years later. Recent enthusiast polls have revealed that the Garter Blue livery wasn't at all popular in the 1990s, possibly because today's generation, having no experience of it, see it as unreal. Certainly, the early BR blue Sir Nigel now wears is a handsome colour that suits the design well. So too does the Brunswick Green on 6009, 
possibly the most versatile of all engine powers. Number 9 has been involved in specials almost continuously since VR withdrew her from regular service in June 1966, except for the three years of strict steam ban from 1968 to 1971. A noteworthy early event took place at Easter 1967. The engine, piloted by a Black 5, took 18 bogies from Carlisle to Perth, a scenario very reminiscent of these engines' regular exploits during the dark days of World War II. Now it's time to turn our attention to Britannia, getting ready to work the 1216 Bishop Stormford to Ely. Joe Bygrave and fireman Dennis Crouch, himself once a driver at King's Cross, were backed up by Britannia support for Plateman Steve Brewer. The Britannias were, of course, on their home ground in East Anglia. For the first batch, including Britannia herself, went straight to Stratford Shed in 1951. And for the next decade, a stud of more than 20 of the class was shedded there and at Norwich. Overnight, the Britannias lifted the Liverpool Street Norwich line from the third division, as it were, of British passenger services straight into the Premiership. Driver Joe Bygrave, a former Stratford man, knew his engines well. Hello. I'm just upsetting. Yeah, I've won. I'm just Sixty miles an hour is maximum speed for me today. Well, now I just want to check in. I thought I checked it. No, I don't think it's a scam. I think it's not out. I don't think it's a scam. It's some. Oh, now I know what's going on. They're a little bit driving, can't be
Britannia was withdrawn by VR in May 1966, ironically from Manchester's Newton Heath Shed, time home of a former Jubilee namesake. Scheduled for special maintenance and then preservation by the British Railways Board, she was stored for a time at Preston Park Works near Brighton, but suffered vandalism. The official choice was switched to the newly overhauled number 70013, Cromwell. All trains were booked to run non-stop, so driver Joe Bygrave needs to be particularly vigilant as he eases Britannia past the crowded platforms of Cambridge. In autumn of 1969, more than a year after the end of steam, Britannia was finally rescued moved to the Severn Valley by the Britannia Locomotive Company Limited. Three years of neglect and vandalism in store had taken their toll, and it was not until May 1978 that she was steamed once more and renamed by her designer, Robert Riddles. In 1980, she moved to the Neen Valley Railway. Then, following the rebuild at Tarnworth, she ran her first preserved mainline trip from Crewe to Hereford back in July 1991. cab was one aspect of the Britannia's that wasn't altogether a resounding success. Crews complained that they were drafty. They were also considered rather hard-riding locomotives, but overall they were efficient, reliable, and free-steaming. While their two cylinders, which against the three or four more usual on engines as they size, successfully saved weight and eased maintenance. On the eastern region in particular, they were extremely popular. The brief their designer, Robert Riddles, had to follow was to evaluate all aspects of existing British specifics and standardize the best. And it's a tribute to Riddles that in the hands of a lesser man, such an instruction could so easily have been a recipe for thorough mediocrity, or worse. By the mid-1960s, all the Britannias were concentrated in the northwest. Indeed, of the 55 engines in the class, all but six were shedded at Carlisle Kingmore when withdrawn. This is number 70012, drawn appropriately to Lancaster. Test bank trucks with a fitted crate. John Gaunt again, leaving Carnford, nameplates having been removed as a precaution against that. the only unnamed Britannia on T Bay Trots in May 1967. Seven double O three eight Robin Hood at nearby Shaft, also in May 1967. Seven Rising Star passes Shaft Station, August 1966. This was one of the batch originally allocated to the Western Region, the South Wales Expresses. <laughs> Another scene at Shaft with 70031 Byron looking sadly run down on the parcels train. Charles 
explored once more at South West with a milk train in August 1965. Alfred the Great on the Saddle and Carlisle Line, also in August 1965. The last four coaches of the train include Stania LMS and Thompson LNE Armstrong. 70013 Oliver Cromwell with a special at Bear Lane near Morecambe in May 1968. All the other remaining Britannias, 13 in number, had been withdrawn in a batch at the end of 1967. The special arrives at Morecambe, still a busy station at the end of steam. Keeping 70013 in tip-top condition was a matter of pride at Carnforth Shed in those final sad months. slightly undersized lettering on the special replacement nameplate. In their final years in the Northwest, all the Britannias had been running without names. The engine is now preserved at Bressingham Steam Museum in Norfolk. So, back once again for the 25th of June, 1995, as Sir Nigel Grasley heads south near Littlebury, halfway between Cambridge and Bishop Stortford. The fields around Littlebury, north of Audley End, are well known for their prolific growth of poppies and the many other fine examples of wild flowers which grow in profusion by the line side. Sir Nigel's new colours show to best advantage as the train continues south. Three different liveries among the carriages mark a rapidly changing scene as the privatisation of VR stretches ahead. Audley End Station is a splendid classical structure by renowned railway architect Francis Thompson and is now listed Grade 2. Originally called Wendon, it was renamed after the nearby stadium home. Today it serves commuters from Saffron Walden and the wide area around. A little further south, number 9 works for 1546 Bishop Stormford to Ely. Elsenham, perhaps best known for its upmarket preserves, was once the junction for the Six Mile Branch to Thaxton, post 1952. The pleasant period buildings here are set off by well tended prize winning gardens. A traction engine rally in an adjoining field brought all the fun of the fair to Elsenham this summer weekend. Visitors to the region seldom realise the number of level crossings on the East Anglian main line, with all the costs and operating hassle they create. Elsenham marks the summit of the line between Liverpool Street and Cambridge. 
By the line side stands the body of the 1928 Pullman car Leona, alias car number 208, used until lately as a static restaurant. This car had the distinction of forming part of Sir Winston Churchill's funeral train in 1965 and ran in the Golden Arrow set until 1972. As she heads south through Elsenham, Britannia faces a mile downhill at 1 in 107, the steepest grade the whole way between Liverpool Street and Ely. And so into Bishop Stortford, with a well-filled train of customers well satisfied with their run behind one of the giants of steam. Tomorrow, Bishop Stortford will be back at the commuter stronghold, and the railway will revert to its everyday role. History dictated that the great steam expresses sped to York through Hitchin and not Cambridge, as the promoters of the old Northern and Eastern Railway hoped 150 years ago. But thanks to Wagon Railway and the enthusiasts who still maintain these superb engines, Cambridgeshire people have had the chance to see and ride behind the finest of British steam on their own line. We hope you enjoyed this spectacle of the weekend as much as those who were there. Bye for now. Thank you.